All right, it's time to get started. I would like to give a warm welcome to Novo's founder and CEO, Chris Maraboli, a serial entrepreneur and longevity expert. Chris's interest in health began when he was 12 and evolved into a passion after he cured a brain tumor when he was 16. Chris has researched and integrated longevity practices and interventions into his life for more than 10 years, and he has achieved a biological age 13.6 years younger than his chronological age. And according to epigenetic tests like Dunedin and Pace, he is aging 31% slower biologically than chronologically. He created Novos, a nutraceutical company with some of the world's top longevity scientists and MDs that help people take control of their health spans and lifespans. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Grace. So welcome to everyone. Today, the topic is the best diet and nutrition for human longevity. A topic I know a lot of us are very interested in. So the usual disclaimer is that this is not medical advice. Always consult with an expert like your medical team. So the agenda for today's call is, uh, number one, an introduction, then going into the importance of nutrition for longevity, discussing which diet is best for longevity, looking at the diet of the longest lived people in the world the scientific benefits of the, the specific diet. Then an interesting question is, can we make an even better diet for longevity? We'll dig into that before going into the components of diet. So specifically about macros and micros and how they relate to longevity. We'll then talk about meal timing and fasting, a topic that a lot of people are interested in when it comes to longevity. And then finally, we'll open up the floor for questions and answers. So many of you have been joining us for all of our webinars and some of you are newcomers. So this is our fifth webinar. If you go to our website, novoslabs.com and you click on the magnifying glass in the top right corner, you can see, uh, you can do a search for webinar and you'll see that we've done it on longe longevity supplements, longevity lifestyle, longevity tests, where we talk about epigenetic tests, the multi, uh, uh, multi-omic tests and more. Uh, longevity technology was the last one and also longevity uh, nutrition of course today will also be on our website once it's available so uh as we typically do we'll, we'll just talk about a primer here which is uh health span versus lifespan this is especially for the newcomers where we uh, just want to give an overview of what the difference is and why this is all relevant. So longevity medicine, it seeks to extend both health span and lifespan while also minimizing the time spent with disease or poor physical health. So if we look at the typical uh, life journey, when someone is born, they're born healthy for most people. And then uh, unfortunately, in, in modern day society, people start to decline in their health from a relatively early age. And then when they hit middle age, typically uh, 40s, 50s, uh, sometimes extending into 60s, their health span ends. So this is defined by having a chronic illness, a disease of aging, like diabetes or cancer or heart disease or uh, neurodegenerative disorders and so on. And then it's a pretty rapid decline from there, although uh, the period in which you have this health span lifespan, lifespan gap is actually larger than ever before. In other words, people are living with disease, uh, so a, a suboptimal life for an extended period of time. When it comes to longevity, this is how we see the ideal health trajectory, where you maintain your health throughout your life until at towards the very end of your life, uh, you might be diagnosed with a chronic illness, ideally not, but you might be. And then at that point, it's a relatively rapid period until death. So you are living a longer lifespan. You're not getting sick until after most of your peers have already passed away. And then when you do pass away, it's a short period in which you're actually sick. So what's the importance of diet and nutrition for longevity? There are multiple factors that impact longevity. As we spoke about in the longevity lifestyle webinar, everything from sleep to exercise, stress management, relationships and purpose, supplementation and more. So where does diet and life uh, and nutrition fit in? Uh, it is among the most important lifestyle factors that can impact lifespan. 
There is a study published in The Lancet in 2017 uh, that analyzed data from over 130,000 participants across five studies. And it found that poor diet was responsible for more deaths than any other risk factor, including smoking. And dietary risks accounted for 11 million deaths globally in 2017, or 22% of all deaths for that year. So poor dietary habits and nutrient deficiencies are linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and neurodegenerative disorders. And conversely, a healthy diet that's rich in nutrients has been associated with a longer health span and lifespan. There was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that found that adherence to a Mediterranean diet was associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and overall mortality. And a diet that's high in processed foods and re refined sugars has been linked to an increased risk of chronic diseases and premature death. Having a higher intake of fruits and vegetables has been associated with a reduced risk of mortality from all causes. And a study published in the journal Nutrients found that higher intake of omega-3 fatty acids was associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. So there are proponents for many different diets, and that's for many different reasons. So the question is, what is the best diet for longevity? In other words, some diets might be better for bodybuilding. Uh, some diets might be better for a social cause like uh, animal welfare. But what is the best diet specifically for longevity? Is it vegetarian or pescatarian, vegan, paleo, ketogenic or DASH, the Ornish diet, Noom, Zone, South Beach, Atkins? As you can see, there's tons of them, carnivore, raw food. The answer is the best diet so far for longevity has been consistently shown to be the Mediterranean diet. In fact, a study that was published just two weeks ago in 2023 found that the Mediterranean diet had the best outcomes of seven diets for all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, stroke, and non-fatal myocardial infarction. So you can see here uh, for diet number one, which is Mediterranean, it uh, the dot being further left and having a smaller range is better, and it is the best for uh, practically all of these different markers. So what exactly is the Mediterranean diet? It's a way of eating based on the traditional cuisine of countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea, such as Greece, Italy, and Spain. And while there's no single Mediterranean diet per se, the following are some general rules. So one is to have a lot of plant-based foods as the foundation of your diet. Everything from fruits to vegetables, nuts, legumes, and whole grains. Number two is olive oil. Olive oil is the primary source of fat in the diet, and it's used in cooking as a salad dressing. Olive oil contains oleic acid, which lowers inflammation and helps fight heart disease, and hydroxytyrosol, which is a polyphenol that reduces inflammation and activates and deactivates enzymes and receptors. Next is fish and seafood. The diet includes moderate amounts of fish and seafood, which are rich in omega-3 fatty acids that support a healthy brain, heart, and reduce inflammation. Lean protein. So the diet includes lean protein sources such as poultry, eggs, and some dairy products. It has a limited amount of red meat. Red meat is consumed in small amounts and is often replaced by plant-based protein sources. Herbs and spices. So the diet emphasizes the use of herbs and spices to add flavor to foods instead of over relying on salt. And these herbs and spices are very high in polyphenols, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, and then finally, red wine. For some, red wine is consumed in moderation with meals, but we caution against this, which we'll also talk about later. So how about the real world evidence of the Mediterranean diet? Let's look at the blue zones of the longest lived people in the world. So number one is Icaria Greece. The Mediterranean diet is a traditional dietary pattern in Greece and is likely a contributing factor to the longevity of the people in Icaria. In addition to the Mediterranean diet, the people of Icaria also practice intermittent fasting, which has been shown to have health benefits and we'll discuss towards the end of the presentation. Next is Sardinia, Italy. The traditional Sardinian diet is very similar to the Mediterranean diet 
with an emphasis on whole grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables. However, the Sardinian diet also includes unique foods such as pecorino cheese and goat milk, which are consumed in moderation. Number three is the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. And the traditional diet of the Nicoyan people is largely plant-based with a focus on beans, corn, and squash, as well as fruits such as mangoes, papayas, and guavas. The Nicoyan diet is also low in meat and dairy, which is consistent with the Mediterranean diet. Number four is Loma Linda, California. And while the Loma Linda community is not located in the Mediterranean region, many members of the Seventh-day Adventist church who live in Loma Linda follow a vegetarian or semi-vegetarian diet that is similar to the Mediterranean diet. This dietary pattern emphasizes plant-based foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, and limits the consumption of meat and dairy. And finally, number five is Okinawa, Japan. The traditional Okinawan diet is low in calories and high in nutrient-dense foods such as sweet potatoes, leafy greens, soy products, and fish. And while the Okinawan diet is not strictly Mediterranean, it shares many similarities with the Mediterranean diet in terms of its emphasis on plant-based foods and limited consumption of red meat. So what are the scientific benefits of the diet? What makes the diet so good? Well, number one is improved cardiovascular health. The Mediterranean diet has been associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, such as heart attacks and strokes, and it outperforms low-fat diets in reducing the risk of cardiovascular events. It has a lower risk of type 2 type diabetes, so adherence to the Mediterranean diet is linked to better blood sugar control and a lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Weight management and obesity prevention. So the Mediterranean diet promotes long-term weight loss and maintenance. Number four is reduced cancer risk. So a higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet is associated with a reduced risk of various types of cancers. For example, colorectal cancer, breast and prostate cancers. It improves cognitive function and it reduces the risk for neurodegenerative diseases. If you're seeing a trend here, these are diseases of aging. The Mediterranean diet is associated with better cognitive function, reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease and slower cognitive decline. And number six, enhanced mood and mental health. Adherence to the Mediterranean diet is linked to a reduced risk of depression and improved mental health. Number seven, increased longevity and reduced mortality. The Mediterranean diet is associated with reduced overall mortality and increased life expectancy. It outperforms low fat and low carb diets in reducing all, all cause mortality. Finally, eight, nutrient diversity. Mediterranean diet has a wide diversity of natural foods, which reduces the amount of nutrient deficiencies as compared to other diets, and it increases microbiome health and related benefits. And compliance. So what good is a diet if you don't follow it? The Mediterranean diet is more agreeable than most other diets, which means that it has a higher adherence and lower dropout rates. So how does the Mediterranean diet impact the latest technology and longevity research, that being epigenetic biological age tests. There's evidence there as well. So there is a study published in GeroScience, which said, quote, our results therefore suggest that the Mediterranean-like diet has a pure rejuvenating impact on the biological clock, and that this result is unconfounded by a potential effect of the intervention on the immune system. In other words, it also improved the immune system. And that's not the only reason why, uh, or, or the only way that this uh, improved biological aging. So the dietary factors that improve epigenetic age have been found to be fish consumption, fruit and vegetable consumption, poultry consumption specifically for uh, the immune system's biological age, uh, and then DNA maintenance cofactors. These are ex examples of these are vitamin B12, folate, et cetera. And then what's bad for it? Well, high insulin and or glucose, which go hand in hand, high C-reactive protein, which is a, an inflammatory uh, marker, high body mass index and waist to hip ratio, high triglycerides, high systolic blood, pr blood pressure, and low HDL cholesterol. If we dig a little bit deeper in, if you control the intake of eight dietary components, specifically increasing vegetables, increasing fruits, increasing nuts and legumes, increasing whole grains, low fat dairy, 
as opposed to full fat dairy, but we'll talk more about dairy soon. Reducing red and processed meats, reducing sugar sweetened beverages, and reducing sodium results in lower biological ages for three of the latest epigenetic clocks. Number one, the most powerful third generation clock, the Dunedin and Pace clock, de declines from, from uh, following these, these components. Uh, number two, Grim Age, which is a second generation clock, very accurate. And number three, the Pheno Age clock. So how could we possibly do better than the Med Mediterranean diet? How can we upgrade it? This is where the Novos longevity diet comes into play, and this is how it differs. So based on the latest research, we have made modifications to the traditional uh, dietary patterns of the Mediterranean diet. Number one, we suggest you replace starches with more nutrient-dense mushrooms, vegetables, legumes, or quinoa. To that earlier point about keeping glucose and insulin low, this will do so. And with the added benefit of the nutrient density, getting more polyphenols and uh, vitamins and minerals. Integrate teas and coffees to replace soft drinks and even water. So teas and coffees also have many antioxidants and polyphenols, uh, which are found to extend health span and uh, lifespan. Replace dairy milk with plant-based alternatives. Dairy, cheese, and yogurt are okay, but in small quantities. Eliminate alcohol to the greatest extent possible. Maintain diet diversity. Have ideally 30 or more natural ingredients per week. Regularly consume fermented foods. Then supplement to cover essential nutrient deficiencies. And finally, supplement with proven longevity ingredients. So we'll go through each of these one by one to prove out the arguments for each of them. So first, mushrooms. Benefit of mushrooms on lifespan. Well, mushroom consumption has been linked to increased lifespan in animal studies. Mushrooms contain bioactive compounds such as polysaccharides and the amino acid ergothionine that have been shown to have anti-aging effects. Ergothionine in particular has been linked to longevity and is found in high concentrations in mushrooms such as shiitake and oyster. Next is dysbiosis. So one of the hallmarks of aging, one of the latest additions to the 12 hallmarks of aging is dysbiosis. Mushrooms contain prebiotic fibers like beta-glucans that can promote the growth of beneficial gut bacteria and prevent dysbiosis. In fact, in mice that are fed beta-glucans, they were able to increase the beneficial gut bacteria such as bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, and they reduced harmful bacteria. Some mushrooms like reishi have, been, have further antimicrobial properties that can prevent dysbiosis. And in a rat study, feeding reishi mushrooms reduced the abundance of harmful bacteria like E. coli and uh, uh, staph in the gut. Further, mushrooms contain polysaccharides and triterpenoids, shown to have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects, which can help pre prevent and ameliorate multiple hallmarks of aging. In particular, beta-glucans in mushrooms have immunomodulatory effects that may help reduce inflammation, a hallmark of aging. In a study on healthy elderly adults consuming a beta-glucan supplement from shiitake mushrooms, Reduce markers of inflammation, such as, as I mentioned earlier, C-reactive protein, as well as interleukin-6, another inflammatory marker. Now, benefits of tea and coffee. For longevity, tea consumption has been associated with increased lifespan. In a study on over 100,000 Chinese adults, those who drank tea regularly had a 20% lower risk of all-cause mortality compared to non-tea drinkers. Now, coffee. Coffee consumption has also been linked to increased lifespan. In a study on over 500,000 European adults, those who drank coffee had a lower risk of mortality from all causes, including cardiovascular disease and cancer. The only exception to that would be those who have very high blood pressure. Uh, coffee can actually increase the cardiovascular risk. So uh, don't consume coffee if you have uh, high blood pressure, though tea is actually okay in that case. Both tea and coffee contain polyphenols, 
which are plant compounds that have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties that can help prevent and ameliorate many of the hallmarks of aging. Tea polyphenols, such as EGCG, found in green tea, have been shown to have neuroprotective effects that can help prevent cognitive decline and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And coffee polyphenols, such as chlorogenic acid, have been shown to have anti-inflammatory effects that can help reduce inflammation. Both tea and coffee have been shown to have cardio, cardioprotective effects. Tea consumption has been associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke, while coffee consumption has been linked to lower risk of heart failure. Now, a truly contentious topic is dairy. So why do we recommend you reduce dairy? Well, it has multiple aspects that are not ideal for longevity. First, let's talk about the molecule galactose. It's found naturally in lactose and is released when lactose is broken down by the small intestine. In animal studies, dietary galactose has been shown to increase oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, and impair cognitive function. A study published in 2021 found that mice fed a high galactose diet had accelerated cognitive decline and increased markers of inflammation in the brain compared to mice fed a controlled diet. Galactose can also lead to cross-linking. Now, it's important to note that there are studies that actually administer galactose to mice specifically to accelerate aging. Another study showed that eight-year-old boys can be made insulin resistant just by making them drink 53 grams of protein from milk rather than getting that dosage of protein from meat, despite their youth. The study said, quote, in the milk group, fasting insulin concentrations doubled, which caused the insulin resistance to increase similarly. Now, these are eight-year-old boys who are close, closer to being born than we are. As we age, we have a harder time dealing with uh, 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 sugars and insulin. Uh, we become less insulin sensitive. It's also worth noting that uh, humans are the only animals that continue to drink milk uh, outside of uh, being newborns. Next, stimulation of growth receptors. So milk contains various substances that stimulate growth receptors in cells like insulin receptors, mTOR, insulin-like growth factor, or IGF receptors. And in biogerontology, which is the science of aging, it's well known that stimulation of these receptors accelerates aging in animals, increases their risk of aging-related diseases, and shortens lifespan. For example, too much stimulation of mTOR and IGF receptors causes cells to maintain themselves less effectively. They'll repair their DNA less or recycle their components less efficiently. Next is association with cancers such as prostate cancers, immune system activation. So skin health issues like eczema uh, are commonly reported from milk intake related to skin health, increased levels of acne due to hormonal effects. And the large Long-term study found that women who drink three or more glasses of milk per day had almost double the risk of dying compared to women who drank less than one glass per day. There is also a strong dose-response relationship. The more milk they drank, the higher the risk of dying, which suggests a direct causal relationship. And the study also found that higher milk intake was associated with increased DNA damage and inflammation. So... If that's not enough uh, reasons to convince you to reduce your milk intake, uh, I'm not sure if we'll ever convince you. Now, when it comes to alcohol, there are arguments that are pro-alcohol. One is claims of heart health for very moderate drinking, one to two glasses with the adage, the dose makes the poison. Uh, red wine contains longevity compounds, or I should say, quote unquote, longevity compounds like resveratrol which have kind of disappointed in many ways, we'll talk more about resveratrol later, um, is alcohol hormetic. In other words, a uh, slight stress on our body from which we come back stronger. Is it an overall psychological de-stressor? Are these reasons why we see what we see in this chart, which is that when someone has less than two drinks per day, uh, their uh, relative risk of mortality declines before it goes back up above one at about two to three drinks. Well, the anti-alcohol arguments 
are that ethanol is a potent toxin, not likely to be hormetic. An example of this is pour alcohol onto um, bacteria or a virus or cells. It destroys them typically in as little as a minute. Um, it does the same thing within our bodies. Um, cells are, are just as vulnerable internally as well. There's a study of, uh, here's, here's a quote, 371,463 individuals, genetic evidence supported a nonlinear, consistently risk-increasing association between all amounts of alcohol consumption and both hypertension and coronary artery disease with modest increases in risk with light alcohol intake and exponentially greater risk increases at higher levels of consumption. The study found moderate drinkers in the previous study where I showed that people with small amounts were doing better, it actually found that those people happened to exercise more, they ate more vegetables and smoked less. So they were overall healthier. And so they were more than accounting for the damaging effects of the alcohol. Uh, but it wasn't the alcohol that was improving the health. If we look at alcohol and epigenetic age, researchers found a 2.22 year age acceleration in individuals studied with alcohol use disorder. And in larger meta-analysis, quote, they said, all four investigated clocks pointed to accelerated aging in alcohol users. Out of eight analyses conducted, seven were statistically significant. So what's Novos's position on alcohol? Alcohol is not a longevity promoting compound. Having small doses on occasion may have a small enough impact on health risk if you're otherwise healthy and have a low cardiovascular risk profile. And many centenarians like Sardinians do consume wine. However, the alcohol itself is not what leads to the old age. It's that they have the combination of lifestyle, diet, sleep, genetics, and so on, which enables them to withstand the damaging effects of alcohol more so than the average mortal, so to speak. So next is diet diversity. What's the value of a diverse diet? Number one is nutrient adequacy. Two is reduced risk of chronic diseases. A diverse diet has been associated with a reduced risk of diseases such as heart disease, type two diabetes, and certain forms of cancer. And it may be due in part to the fact that a diverse diet provides a range of beneficial compounds such as antioxidants and phytochemicals beyond just the vitamins and minerals. It also improves our gut health. A diverse diet can help promote the growth of beneficial gut bacteria, which play a key role in digestion immunity, and overall health. And consuming a wide range of plant-based foods in particular can help support a healthy gut microbiome. To that point of a microbiome is fermented foods. So it improves your gut health. Fermented foods contain benefit, beneficial bacteria or probiotics that can help support a healthy gut microbiome, which in turn can improve gut function and support a healthy immune system. And for many people, this is more than enough Forget about taking uh, probiotic supplements. If you're getting adequate fermented foods in your diet, uh, you're going to get a much higher dosage of beneficial bacteria than you would get from any pill. Reduced inflammation. Some fermented foods such as kefir or kefir and kimchi contain anti-inflammatory compounds that may help reduce chronic inflammation in the body. Enhanced nutrient absorption. So fermented foods can also help enhance the absorption of certain nutrients, such as iron and zinc, by breaking down anti-nutrients that exist in some plant-based foods that can inhibit their absorption. It also improves mental health. The gut microbiome may play a role in mental health, and consuming probiotics through fermented foods may have a positive impact on mood and stress levels. Studies have found that consuming fermented foods may be associated with reduced symptoms of anxiety and depression. This is something that oftentimes people turn to alcohol for. So this is, although it will take a longer time, it's not an acute immediate effect like alcohol is. If you're getting a healthier microbiome, many of the things you might turn to alcohol for might actually improve through this healthier approach. And potential disease prevention. Studies have suggested that fermented foods may be associated with a reduced risk of diseases. A 2020 study found that patients who took natto, the Japanese probiotic uh, food, for a year reversed carotid artery plaque and thickness by 36% and 22% respectively. 
The study said, quote, the most unique features of natto is that as a single compound, it possesses multiple cardiovascular disease preventative and alleviating pharmacologic effects, namely antithrombotic, antihypertensive, and anticoagulant, antiatherosclerotic, and neuroprotective effects. Now, on to supplements. Why supplements? Let's start with general health supplements. Micronutrients that are considered essential for health would be the general health supplements. This is vitamins like A, B, C, D, E, K, et cetera, and minerals like magnesium and sodium, potassium, and so on. Why would you supplement? Well, first, the human body is not made to absorb nutrients properly. We see this with iron deficiencies, iodine deficiencies, choline, uh, more than 80, 90% of people are deficient in choline, B vitamin deficiencies, vitamin C dependence, other animals produce it, we need to get it externally through food. And absorption further degrades as we age, our microbiomes don't absorb the food as well as we get older and will not therefore absorb the nutrients as well. Next, our food is very different now compared to prehistoric times. It's micronutrient poor, calorie rich processed foods. Also, novel methods of agriculture today yield fewer nutrients in whole foods than they did when they were, uh, you know, wild plants, for example, that we had throughout evolution. We have different and inflammatory lifestyles now. We spend much more time indoor, indoors. We have little natural exercise. Uh, we have alcohol, smoking, pollution. We have higher levels of stress, allergies, leaky gut, et cetera. All of this increases inflammation in our body, which then therefore requires more nutrients for the body to be able to fend that off. Next, government recommended intakes for most nutrients are too low. When the government establishes these guidelines, they look at short-term studies for short-term disease avoidance, like scurvy, but they don't look at decades and trying to figure out how to reduce disease risk over the span of 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Higher doses are necessary for optimal healthy aging, especially after you exit your 20s and get into your 30s and beyond. Now, next is longevity supplements. We'll talk specifically about Novo's Core and Boost. Uh, so the aim of longevity supplements is to go beyond basic health to slow down our pace of aging and extend health span and lifespan. And Novos offers the very first and the most studied solution to address all 12 hallmarks of aging simultaneously, as you can see depicted here. Now, when we formulated Novos Core and Boost with a team of eight longevity scientists, MDs, and experts, uh, we, we set these standards. So each ingredient had to follow um, these 10 standards. So one, they have the ability to impact aging mechanisms or the hallmarks of aging. And ideally two, they impact multiple mechanisms at the same time. Three, they have been able to extend lifespan in various animal models, hinting at conserved evolutionary pathways across animals, including into humans. Four, they are associated with reduced risk of different aging-related processes, hinting that they act on the underlying aging process. Five, they're associated with reduced risk of mortality in humans. Six, they're recognized as safe by the FDA, EFSA, and other organizations. Seven, they're nature-based, and by extension, eight, ideally, in some cases, they're found in the human body, but levels decrease with age. Nine, they have a very low side effect profile. And 10, they've been used for many decades or even centuries to treat specific symptoms or afflictions in humans without any serious side effects. So studies that we've conducted with Novos Core and Boost, uh, there are many ongoing, but here are some early results we can share. So first, in an in vitro human cell study, we showed that the reduction of DNA damage from irradiation was as high as 77% and I believe 68% on average compared to untreated human cells. This number was off the charts. Uh, the lab that had done studies amounting to about $7 million with other um, ingredients, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, and even components of Novos Core, but individual components as opposed to the synergistic formula, uh, had reported to us prior to the study that they did not find any significant effects 
and they were very excited by the results we found with Novos Quorum Boost. Another study conducted at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom found uh, in in vitro human cells a senostatic effect on senescent cells, and the results were comparable to the prescription gold standard longevity drug rapamycin. And in a recent human case study, we found that the participants, 73% of them had a reduced biological age to a statistically significant margin, and 0% had a statistically significant increase in biological age. And the p-value or the confidence that this was not co coincidence is 0 0.001 or one in a thousand compared the, to the typical biology p-value requirement for statistical significance of 0 0.05. This is 50 times more powerful than the typical minimum requirement by scientists. So let's dig in and dissect the components of diet as they pertain to longevity. Let's start with macronutrients and we'll go with protein first. Protein is, an essential, is essential for building and repairing tissues in the body, including muscles, organs, and bones. And the quality of protein is important for longevity because it affects the body's ability to utilize the amino acids that the protein contains. High quality protein sources provide a complete range of essential amino acids, while low quality sources may lack one or more EAAs. Now, essential amino acids are those that the body cannot produce on its own and needs to get through diet. Everything from histidine to methionine and phenylalanine and tryptophan and so on. Some amino acids such as methionine may have negative effects on longevity when consumed in excess. It's part of the reason why high consumption of animal proteins might not be ideal for longevity. Methionine restriction has been shown to increase lifespan in animal studies. Plant-based protein sources, which are lower in methionine, can be high quality if consumed in combination to provide a complete range of essential amino acids. For example, rice pro protein on its own would not have the complete spectrum, but combining it with beans would. Animal-based protein sources, such as meat, fish, and dairy, are generally high-quality sources of protein. However, some studies suggest that excessive consumption of animal protein may have negative effects on health and longevity. Overall, having a balanced diet that includes a variety of high-quality protein sources, both plant-based and animal-based, is important for promoting longevity and health span. Next, let's look at carbohydrates. They're an important source of energy for the body and are essential for brain function. And although the uh, liver can produce um, sugar to, to keep the brain alive, it is a metabolically intense, stressful process to do so. Um, and ideally, it's easier on the body to provide that uh, exogenously, in other words, through foods. Different forms of carbohydrates have different effects on health and longevity. For example, high glycemic index carbohydrates and from now on, you're going to see words highlighted in red, orange, or green. Red being things you want to avoid, orange being okay, but in limited doses, and green being something you want to have as much of as, you, as, as reasonably uh, uh, possible. So high glycemic carbohydrates, such as refined sugars and processed grains, have been linked to increased risk of chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Whereas low glycemic index carbs, such as whole grains, legumes, and vegetables, have been associated with improved health outcomes and increased lifespan. Prebiotic carbohydrates, such as inulin, fructooligosaccharides, or FOS, and galactooligosaccharides, or GOS, can promote the growth of beneficial gut bacteria and improve gut health, which is linked to improved overall health and longevity. FOS can be found in onions, chicory, garlic, asparagus, and banana, and GAS can be found in legumes and beans. Fiber is a type of carbohydrate that is not digested by the body, has been shown to have numerous health benefits, including improved gut health, lower risk of chronic diseases, and increased lifespan. And specific foods that are high in this are whole grains, such as oats and quinoa, legumes, such as lentils, chickpeas, and black beans, vegetables like broccoli, spinach, and sweet potatoes, fruits like berries, apples, citrus fruits, and overall, a diet that includes a variety of high fiber, low glycemic index carbs, along with prebiotic sources, can promote longevity and health span. Now let's look at fats. For the sake of time, we only look at omega-3 fats because they're amongst the most powerful for your health. Omega-3 fatty acids, 
are a polyunsaturated fat that are essential for human health. And they've been linked to numerous health benefits, including reduced risk of heart disease, improved brain function and reduced risk of cognitive decline, reduced inflammation in the body, improved joint health and reduced risk of arthritis, reduced risk of certain types of cancer. And the three main types of omega-3 fatty acids are EPA, DHA, and ALA. EPA and DHA are found primarily in fatty fish and other seafood, while ALA is a plant-based form of omega-3 found in flax seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts. And while both animal source and plant-based omega-3s can provide certain health benefits, there are some differences between the two. Specifically, EPA and DHA are much more readily absorbed in the body and utilized than ALA. And their benefits on brain health and heart health are more significant than ALA. But plant-based sources of omega-3s may also contain other beneficial compounds like fiber and antioxidants that we've been talking about that are not found in the animal sources. So overall, a diet that includes a balance of both animal source and these plant-based sources of omega-3 can provide numerous health benefits. Now let's go into the micronutrients. I'll zip through these as fast as I can. So vitamin A is essential for healthy vision, immune system function, and cell growth. And the top five foods are beef liver, sweet potatoes, carrots, spinach, and kale. Uh, vitamin B1 or thiamine supports energy, metabolism, nerve function, and helps prevent cardiovascular disease. Found in yeast extract, you want to be careful with that for yeast overgrowths, uh, sunflower seeds, pork, macadamia, nuts, and lentils. Vitamin B2, riboflavin, is essential for cell growth, energy metabolism, and antioxidant function. Top five foods, you might see a theme here with beef liver, almonds, fortified cereals, which we don't recommend, yogurt, uh, and mushrooms. Yogurt is uh, ideally not a dairy form of yogurt. Vitamin B3, niacin. Niacin supports energy metabolism, DNA repair, and helps maintain healthy skin. Top five foods, tuna, chicken breast, turkey, salmon, and peanuts. You need to be careful with peanuts because of mycotoxins. Vitamin B5, pantothenic acid, is vital for energy, metabolism, hormone production, and the synthesis of coenzyme A, which supports overall health. Top five foods, beef liver, sunflower seeds, shiitake mushrooms, avocado, salmon. B6, pyroxidine, is crucial for brain function, immune system support, and amino acid metabolism. Top five foods, chickpeas, tuna, salmon, chicken, and turkey. B7, or biotin, plays a role in energy metabolism, gene regulation, and many of us know healthy hair, skin, and nails. Top five foods are egg yolks, uh, almonds, sunflower seeds, sweet potatoes, and onions. B9 or folate is essential for DNA synthesis, cell division, and proper brain function, which you get from spinach, lentils, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, and avocado. B12, cobalamin, it's crucial for nerve function, red blood cell production, and DNA synthesis. You get it from clams and oysters, beef liver, sardines, salmon, and fortified nutritional yeast. Vitamin C is a powerful antioxidant that supports immune function, collagen synthesis, and helps protect against chronic diseases. You get it from guava, kiwi, bell peppers, strawberries, and oranges. Vitamin D is essential for calcium absorption, immune function, and bone health. Supplementation for vitamin D is best. Moderate sun exposure is also okay. Uh, but for top five foods, cod liver oil has a fair amount in it. Um, and then significantly declining from there, fatty fish, salmon, mackerel, fortified dairy products, which we don't recommend, egg yolks, and beef liver. Vitamin E is powerful, a powerful antioxidant that protects cells from damage and supports immune function. Easiest form is from food for the full spectrum of tocopherols and tocotrienols. You don't want to focus only on one tocopherol, for example, uh, because it has negative health outcomes at high dosages from supplements. Uh, so top five foods are almonds, sunflower seeds, hazelnuts, spinach, and avocado. Almost done. Vitamin K is cru crucial for blood clotting, bone health, and regulating inflammation. Um, it works alongside vitamin D to make sure calcium ends up where it needs to end up in your bones rather than in your arteries and veins. Top five foods are fermented natto, as I mentioned earlier, as a really great um, healthy food. 
kale, spinach, Swiss chard, Brussels sprouts. Now essential minerals, calcium is essential for strong bones, teeth, proper muscle and nerve function and brain function. Top five foods, collard greens, dairy products, which we say to avoid sardines, fortified plant-based milks, tofu, even protein powders. Make sure if you're pulling out dairy that you're getting adequate calcium in your diet. Um, I had a period where I wasn't and I had to start supplementing um, and watching my food intake. Magnesium is vital for energy production, bone health, and regulating muscle and nerve function. Top five foods, pumpkin seeds, spinach, Swiss chard, almonds, and quinoa. Potassium helps maintain fluid balance, supports muscle and cognitive function, and regulates blood pressure, which promotes longevity. Less than 2% of Americans achieve the recommended daily intake of 4.7 grams. Top five foods are beet greens, uh, potatoes with the skin, white beans, bananas, avocado, or potassium salt. You can get something, for example, called light salt, which is 50% sodium, 50% potassium. I use it every day, even post-workout instead of electrolyte drinks. To that point, sodium is essential for maintaining fluid balance, nerve and cognitive function, and muscle contractions. You need a higher intake if you exercise regularly. If you've ever felt extremely fatigued after a long workout, as I have, it turned out it was from inadequate sodium. And adding this light salt to multiple glasses of water um, gets me back on my feet right away. Top five foods, salt, pickles, many soups, shrimp, vegetable juices. Zinc is critical for immune function, wound healing, and DNA synthesis. You get it from oysters, beef, pumpkin seeds, lentils, and cashews. Copper plays a role in energy production, iron metabolism, and the maintenance of connective tissue, which you get from beef liver, oysters, shiitake mushrooms, almonds, and cashews. Manganese is important for bone health, energy metabolism, and antioxidant function, which you get from mussels, hazelnuts, pineapple, spinach, and pumpkin seeds. Boron supports bone health, brain function, and may help reduce inflammation, which you get from raisins, almonds, hazelnuts, avocado, and prunes. Iodine is essential uh, for proper thyroid gland functioning, which regulates metabolism as well as cognitive function and fetal development. Most people are deficient in iodine. Uh, they, they turn to iodized salts as if that would give enough of a dosage of iodine, uh, but the iodine actually dissipates over time from, from that salt shaker and you can become deficient pretty quickly. So you can get it from seaweed, cod, yogurt, shrimp, and navy beans. Selenium, which works together with iodine, um, supports thyroid function and can help reduce the risk of certain cancers and cardiovascular disease, which you get first and foremost from Brazil nuts, followed by yellowfin tuna, halibut, sardines, and turkey. Next is phytonutrients or phytochemicals, which are biologically active compounds found in plants that are not considered essential nutrients, but have been shown to have a range of health benefits, which include flavonoids, phenolic acids, lignans, still beans, and they're important for human longevity because they have been shown to have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer properties. And these properties can help protect against chronic disease that can shorten lifespan like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and certain forms of cancer. Additionally, they've been shown to have anti-aging effects such as reducing oxidative stress and inflammation and improving cognitive function. So here are a few anthocyanins, uh, for the sake of time, I won't dig into these, but you can find them in blueberries, blackberries, cherries, and red cabbage. Fisetin, which you can find in Novos Core and in strawberries, has been shown to reduce the risk of cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, um, might have anti-aging effects by reducing age-related inflammation and improving cognitive function. Bursetin, uh, which you can find in apples. Resveratrol which is a popular longevity ingredient, though there's a lot of controversy that most people aren't aware of, uh, which is that the studies done in uh, the early 2000s um, were not the, the strongest of studies and uh, they haven't been replicated, especially in humans. Um, so it's relatively disappointing. Um, a substitute, which is much more promising, is terostilbene, which is a close cousin. Uh, they've been, terostilbene is found in blueberries, grapes, and some tree bark. It's been found to have better oral absorption than resveratrol, a longer half-life, 
and the benefit of having methyl groups attached, which can further improve methylation for your epigenome and NAD plus production. It's been shown to have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, may help reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. It's also been shown to improve insulin sensitivity, lower blood sugar levels. Some research suggests it might have neuroprotective effects. Um, and it might have anti-aging effects by activating certain genes involved in cellular repair and slowing down the aging process. Let's go into meal timing now. When you eat can be nearly as important as what you eat. Not quite as important, but nearly as important. Uh, circadian rhythms and metabolism. So disruption of circadian rhythms can lead to metabolic dysfunction, which is associated with increased risk of chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And eating patterns that align with circadian rhythms, such as consuming most calories earlier in the day, have been shown to improve glucose regulation and reduce insulin resistance. Number two is the impact on weight management, glucose regulation, and inflammation. Irregular meal timing and eating at night have been linked to higher body weight, poorer glucose regulation, and increased inflammation. Time-restricted feeding, a type of meal timing in which all calories are consumed within a limited window of time each day, has been shown to improve weight management, glucose regulation, and inflammation. Eating earlier in the day and avoiding late-night meals may also help improve weight management and metabolic health. So time-restricted feeding involves consuming all calories within a limited window of time each day, typically 8 to 12 hours. Common examples include 16-8, in which all calories are consumed within an eight-hour window and fasting for the remaining 16 hours, and 14-10, in which all calories are consumed within a 10-hour window and fasting for the remaining 14 hours. It has benefits for weight loss, metabolic health, and longevity. TRF has been shown to improve weight loss and metabolic health in both animal and human studies. In addition to improving weight management and glucose regulation, TRF has been associated with reduced inflammation and improved markers of cardiovascular health. And it may also have anti-aging effects as it has been shown to improve cellular health and reduce oxidative stress. So animal studies have shown that TRF can increase lifespan and delay the onset of age-related diseases. And a recent study on healthy adults found that 18-6 TRF improved cardiometabolic risk factors and reduced hunger without affecting energy intake. So next is fasting. Intermittent fasting, IF, involves cycling between periods of eating and fasting, typically with a daily eating window of four to 10 hours. Very similar and connected to time-restricted feeding. Um, a lot of carryover between the two. Periodic fasting involves longer periods of fasting, typically ranging from 24 hours to several days. The fasting mimicking diet is a low calorie plant-based diet designed to mimic the effects of fasting without the need for complete abstinence from food. Fasting has been shown to promote cellular repair processes such as autophagy in which cells break down and recycle old or damaged components. Fasting has also been shown to reduce inflammation in the body, which is a key contributor to many chronic diseases. In animal studies, have suggested that fasting can increase lifespan and delay the onset of age-related diseases. A review of human studies on intermittent fasting concluded that it can improve metabolic health, reduce inflammation, and potentially increase lifespan. A randomized controlled trial found that periodic fasting improved cardiovascular risk factors and reduced markers of inflammation in adults at risk for heart disease. And a study on the fasting mimicking diet found that it improved markers of aging and disease risk in healthy adults. Animal studies have shown that periodic fasting can increase lifespan and improve markers of health and aging. And if we look at this in a epigenetic context, we find with the Dunedin pace clock and the calorie random, randomized control trial, it was the first of its kind trial of long-term caloric restriction in healthy non-obese adults. Uh, and it found to ascertain the potential usefulness of Dunedin pace as a measure for trials of geroprotector treatments, the algorithm was applied to DNA methylation data from a randomized trial of caloric restriction, uh, specifically the calorie trial. Um, and sorry, you can see in the chart here that those in the caloric restriction had a significant reduction in the pace of um, uh, biological aging. Again, with the Dunedin pace, combining the two and upgrading to the Novos longevity diet, 
is likely the best way to slow down your pace of aging. We're coming to a conclusion soon, uh, bringing everything together. So this study of the Mediterranean diet, one and a half years, epigenetically reversed with a personalized um, approach for the Mediterranean diet. Uh, 0.23 year re reduced biological age in the Moli Sinai cohort. Caloric restriction, pace of aging is reduced by 0.41 years per one chronological year after reducing caloric intake by 11%. So let's bring it all together in this concluding slide. The Novos Longevity Nutrition Recommendations. One is to consider the Novos Longevity Diet, otherwise the Mediterranean diet or a diet that closely resembles them, specifically a low glycemic vegetable and fruit-based diet as the foundation. Eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, et cetera, broccoli, et cetera berries, citrus, and a rainbow of plants. Integrate diet diversity, 30 or more ingredients. This includes herbs, spices, mushrooms, legumes, and fermented foods. Uh, specific species count as a different ingredient. For example, shiitake mushrooms and oyster mushrooms would count as two ingredients. Moderate amounts of animal protein in order of priority, fatty fish, eggs, lean white meats, minimize red meat and dairy. How much protein? Well, 0.6 grams of protein per pound or 0.72 grams per pound for athletes and those over 50 to 60 years old. Don't char or overcook your foods. This produces advanced glycation end products in your food. It denatures the proteins and it oxidizes the fats. Replace soft drinks with teas, coffee, and decaf. Consider adding lemon or apple cider vinegar to your water with meals, which can help with glucose control and digestion. Use olive oil as your main source of oil. Eat high polyphenol foods like 80% plus chocolate and flax seeds. Supplement for nutrient deficiencies and proven longevity compounds that are found in Novo's Core and Novo's Boost. Use potassium salts or potassium plus sodium blends like light salt. And then integrate time-restricted feeding and fasting. Start with a 10-hour eating window, then reduce it down to six to eight hours. Shift that eating window earlier rather than later. So the, ideally, you're having breakfast and lunch and an early dinner rather than skipping breakfast. Uh, it's not the end of the world if you do, but uh, better health outcomes if you're eating earlier. Don't eat within three hours of bedtime. And experiment with 24-hour or longer fasts, assuming clearance from your medical doctor, assuming adequate body weight, assuming you don't have too many other stressors on your body, um, many different assumptions you need to, to make, and you should look into it further before you actually do it. So what we suggest at Novos is that you get started by tracking. You can track with Novos age, it is the world's most accurate and precise biological age kit. There are other companies launching uh, kits and even having famous scientists behind them. Uh, they don't have the proof behind their clocks like the Novos Age Kit does using Columbia and Duke University's uh, Dunedin Pace Clock as the foundation with an ICC value of greater than 0.96. Other companies don't even publish this number. They might not even know their number. Um, next is treat Novos Core. Uh, treatment of, of longevity. So take Novos Core and Boost. Core patent pending formulation is the first and most powerful uh, and most studied supplement to address the 12 causes of aging. And you can learn more about this at novoslabs.com slash best supplement. And then learn, learn more about longevity through things like this webinar, uh, the content we put together on our blog. As a public benefit corporation, we offer lots of free resources for people, which you can learn more about at novoslabs.com slash blog. These are the scientific references for everything I've presented. For, I know you can't see them, but anyone on YouTube in the future can. Um, so with that said, I'll open the floor to questions. Chris, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I am one starting to get very hungry seeing all these images and hearing about all this delicious food. And I'm also excited to start experimenting by adding some of these ingredients into my diet. We have a Fantastic. ton of questions in the Q and A, and we also had a bunch of pre-submitted questions. So I think we'll get started with those. For those of you okay. who are interested in staying on, I know we're going a little over, but we're gonna be here for the next 10 to 15 minutes having a Q&A, and we'd love to have you stay on. To start, Chris, 
we have a question about the gut microbiome. Research has shown that a healthy gut microbiome has great influence over our health. Assuming this is the case, how does Novo's core assist in this regard? So I have to admit this question was given to me before presenting. So I had some time to prepare a couple of slides uh, to address this. So let me skip to those. So uh, here is the research we pulled up specifically related to the gut biome or dysbiosis, one of the hallmarks of aging. And it shows that 11 out of 12 ingredients in Novo's core, as well as NMN and Novo's Boost, which we'll get to in a moment, have evidence of favorable effects on dysbiosis. So you can see everything from alpha ketoglutarate to glycine, rhodiola, glucosamine, and so on. Um, and you can quickly take a look at these different studies um, by their title, and then also the notes that we have here to get a rough idea of what they do for the uh, microbiome and dysbiosis. So we'll move on. This is the second slide with uh, studies 14 through 26. Now, terastilbene is included, fisetin, microdose lithium, um, ginger, hyaluronic acid, and notice that many of these are actually in human studies not only animal studies. Uh, and then the next slide, uh, the final slide in which it talks about uh, L-theanine uh, and then moves on to Novo's Boost's ingredient, uh, NMN, and the impact that NMN has been shown in animal studies to uh, promote a healthy balance of gut microbiota. So overall, uh, as, as we've been updating, uh, we have more than 300 studies supporting the inclusion of all of the ingredients in Novos core alone for the 12 hallmarks of aging. If you go to novoslabs.com slash evidence and you scroll about three quarters of the way down the page, you'll see a table with these 300 plus studies and you can search by specific keywords. Um, uh, in, in this case, dysbiosis would yield these results, um, but there might be other things that you're curious about. Uh, you can search uh, brain or heart and so on and see which studies come up for ingredients in our formula. And then you can dig into those studies for yourself and make up your own minds with your own critical reasoning. Great, thank you for sharing. I just linked out our evidence page. So you can follow that link and scroll down to view the 300 plus studies we have on our ingredients. So I know you mentioned Novos age previously. Um, we received a handful of questions in the chat and one pre-submitted question. More people want to know how the test works. Is it a blood test? Is it a cheek swab? And then what makes Novos age different from other tests on the market? I'm happy you asked that question. Uh, so first of all, it is a blood test. It's intentionally a blood test because cheek swabs, as uh, most people probably figure, are not nearly as accurate and capable as uh, blood tests are. Uh, and so uh, as a company that's focused on giving you the very best that is possible in the scientific arena, um, it's not necessarily about convenience um, as much as it is about uh, getting you the very best. And when it comes to biological age tests, accuracy is of utmost importance. Otherwise, if you're not accurate and you're not precise, what is the point of taking the test in the first place? If you stepped on a scale and each time it told you that you're a different weight and the variance was off by 10 or 20 pounds, what's the point of stepping on that scale and paying hundreds of dollars for it? So specifically, um, I mentioned before an ICC. Um, so the ICC is a measure of the accuracy of uh, repeat tests of the uh, epigenetic clock. The Novos Age Kit, which contains Dunedin Pace as the foundational element, has an ICC value of 0 0.96, greater than 0 0.96. This is the highest of all biological age tests out there. There are private companies that sell their own biological age tests, quote unquote, oftentimes not actually measuring biological age. It's just things that are loosely correlated with biological age. And they don't publish ICC values either because they don't know them or because their values are significantly below 0 0.96. So if you don't get an ICC value from the company, you should first and foremost be very suspect of what they're offering. Next is that 
we offer a third generation test. There are first generation Horvath tests, second generation Grim Age and Pheno Age tests, and then one third generation test, which is Dunedin Pace. It tracks 28 different biomarkers in a long longitudinal analysis. So it followed more than a thousand people throughout their lifetimes with all of these 28 plus metrics uh, and then built the algorithms around that. What better way to see how people age than to actually follow them on their life lifelong journey of aging and different people with different lifestyles and some smokers, some not, some abused as children, unfortunately, others not. All of these things were accounted for. And then looking at things like, um, uh, you know, white matter in the brain, um, uh, different blood biomarkers, sit stand test, gait speed, and so on. All of this is accounted for in the uh, in the clock that we offer. More than 45 studies have been conducted on the Dunedin Pace clock at more than 30 scientific labs across the world. Uh, most other clocks out there are corporate black boxes. They make it internally. Uh, they're not accountable to you, the consumer. Uh, the clock we use, we sourced from academia because it is open source, so to speak. Um, it is uh, available for scientific scrutiny because we believe that's how you get the best results and that's how you stay and remain the most honest, so to speak, by having um, that type of that type of information publicly available. Um, pace of aging, which is what Dunedin Pace tracks, is the most sensitive to change, and it's forward-looking or future-looking. The rate at which you're aging is going to influence you tomorrow, whereas your biological age, which is what most companies push, and we do offer that in our kit, but we don't emphasize it, is more of the rear view, mirror view, right? You're looking back historically. What's most important is improving your lifespan and health span from this point forward. Um, uh, we also include, as I mentioned, biological age, as well as telomere length. So telomere length is not going to tell you your biological age, despite what some people might claim, uh, but it is a biomarker that's rele relevant for longevity and you can impact the weight at the, the, the rate at which your telomeres uh, uh, attrition takes place. Uh, and so, and that can be changed through lifestyle, diet, and supplements. And so it's something that we think is worthwhile for you to, to keep an eye on. Um, and then a few other facts, uh, the, the, the clocks that we use have been trained on 20,000 plus humans. Uh, other companies offer clocks that are trained on 8,000 8, is, is a number that's shown as being a big number. Well, you know, it's it's really not that big compared to what we've got. Uh, we have a wide range of ages from eight to 102 years old. We've got significant ethnic diversity across Asian, African, uh, Northern European, um, across many, many different study cohorts. Um, and others make the claim that they're ethnic, ethnically diverse, but they don't give any um, specific examples as to how they are. So um, overall, I think you can tell we are convinced that we have uncovered the best test out there and we were able to bring it to you, the consumer, uh, and we'll continue to look for future innovations in the space to continue to bring you the very best, uh, but we're not married to one single test that we built internally we are focused on bringing you the very best test available. Thanks for sharing, Chris. We have time for one or two more questions, if that's all right with you. Sure. Okay. Someone asked, my friend switched to a full carnivore diet and is feeling fantastic. What is your opinion about this? So... Carnivore diets have become very popular lately. In fact, in some sense, I would say that they've even become somewhat political. I mean, it's, I think it's silly, but this idea of, you know, uh, vegans are associated with one side of the political aisle and meat eaters are with the other side of the political aisle. I don't care to get into that. Uh, what I think is most important is looking through the context of longevity and health, what is going to be the best for us? Uh, and then you can decide with your own personal values what you want to follow, but we're about giving you that information. And so when it comes to the carnivore diet, first of all, why is your friend feeling so good? Well, I would say that it's possibly because they have some sensitivities to certain foods that they were consuming. Uh, they may have also been consuming unhealthy foods, um, processed foods, and so on that they have eliminated because they are now going on to a strict diet. And had they gone to a strict Mediterranean diet, 
they may have felt as good or better. Another idea uh, or concept to be aware of is the idea of a, an, an elimination diet. So there are specific foods that people are highly sensitive to, or there's a higher chance that you have some sort of reaction or allergy to. Um, and those are foods like uh, shellfish and eggs and nuts and so on. And so if you follow an elimination diet, you can detect or understand which foods might be making you feel suboptimally. For me, I did this and I discovered that nuts were making me feel fatigued after about two to three hours post consumption. So I would have um, a handful of nuts or sometimes a protein bar, meal replacement bar, a natural one made with nuts. And about two, three hours later, I had to lay down on the couch and sleep for an hour or two. And when I woke up, I felt exhausted and I couldn't figure it out for more than a year. And eventually with an elimination diet, I discovered it was nuts. I got rid of nuts and I've never for more than six, seven years now had that issue a single time. So um, that's another thing to consider. Now, in terms of health and longevity, we wouldn't recommend the carnivore diet for all of the reasons we discussed. Quick summary, number one is you don't want to overdo the animal proteins because of all of the growth pathways they stimulate like mTOR and IGF and so on. Um, Overstimulation of those is not good for longevity. Number two is you're not doing any good for your microbiome. So you're not getting the fiber, you're not getting the, the prebiotics, all of these things that help to colonize the gut and to build a diverse range of, um, of probiotics within your gut, which are shown to have many, many different health benefits. Um, and you're also probably going to be lacking some vitamins and minerals by only having this very narrow um, uh, set of animal products of, of meat. Uh, so overall, no, we would not recommend the carnivore diet specifically for the sake of longevity. That makes sense. Thanks for sharing. For those of you who want to learn more about carnivore diets, I'm going to link a blog in the chat right now so you can dive into that. For our final question, um, we get this a lot. We we get, you know, what should I prioritize? When is it too much? So someone asked, could I be overdoing it with biohacking and supplements? When is it too much? We'd love to hear your thoughts, Chris. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, so the quick answer is yes, you can be overdoing it. Um, so there's the psychological side of all of this, right? You, you need to approach biohacking, so to speak, and longevity specifically from a very healthy psychological position. Uh, as we talked about in longevity lifestyle webinar, there are other aspects of health um, or, or of, of your life that impact your longevity, specifically psychological ones and relationship driven ones. So um, I've seen in my life, people who are biohacking to such a degree that they can no longer go out to eat with their friends because there's nothing that they can eat on the menu. Um, or um, when they do go out to eat, they're not eating anything and they're making their friends or their partner feel awkward that they're just sitting there. Um, is that the most ideal for building relationships and having a, um, a strong, um, healthy, enjoyable experience for yourself and, and for your loved ones? I would argue, no, that's probably not. Um, so, uh, and then people can go to extremes with things. They can experiment with so many different substances, so many different lifestyle interventions that they end up, um, hypothesizing or predicting that they know how to like flip another switch and it's by adding something or removing something and that it's going to then have a, a even more favorable health outcome only to learn that it doesn't because you're dealing human biology is so complex and when you get that specific in particular about everything and supplementing with so many different things it's hard to account for all of it uh, we we see people, biohackers in the longevity space, for example, who um, some of which get get a healthy amount of press um, that are going in our estimation to an unhealthy degree where they are, for example, uh, getting to extremely low body fat percentages, having very low caloric intake, uh, and uh, then also adding things like testosterone replacement therapy and 
DHEA, these androgenic hormones, which are counter to longevity on top of it. And it's like, well, on the one hand, caloric restriction is good for longevity, possibly because it reduces androgenic hormones like testosterone and DHEA, only to then be adding the testosterone and DHEA on top of it again. So it's just, I think that there is the possibility of going too far with all of this. And so we, as a company, we want to simplify it as much as possible. I know I, we covered a lot in this webinar. It's because we have a more sophisticated uh, viewership for this webinar, but overall giving a simple supplement, for example, a drink mix that has the most powerful proven longevity ingredients so that you don't have to go crazy buying a dozen different bottles of pills and taking 19 of them as we did the calculation once. Um, telling you what foods you should eat and which ones you shouldn't eat and giving you a simple set of uh, eight or 10 rules for what your diet should look like, um, giving you the lifestyle advice and so on. We want to simplify this process and make it something achievable for everyone without having a negative impact on their psychological and social um, health, if you will. Thanks for sharing, Chris. I know that the blog is a great resource for me to get easy digestible information. So I'm actually gonna link that for everyone now. We have over a hundred blogs on our website that give different tips and tricks on how to slow down aging. So I highly recommend taking a look. We have a search bar where you can type in different keywords to find blogs that you might be interested in. Before we sign off today, I want to let you all know that you can ask us questions anytime. We have a Q&A form that you can fill out. I linked that in the chat right now. So you can ask us any longevity, biohacking related questions, and we'll do our best to answer those questions during events like these today across social media, email, and more. If you're interested in learning more about how to live younger for longer, please make sure to follow and subscribe to our email newsletter and follow us on Instagram at Novos Labs. That's all I have on my end. Chris, did you have anything else? No, I think that's all. I all said right. more than enough. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We look forward to hosting more events like these in the future.